what is orange and sounds like a parrot a carrot brilliant right um 3.1.1.2 um i think this is the last video for tectonics might be one more actually uh management can reduce the effects of a tectonic hazard we will focus only on uh this section uh, your second bullet point here i'll do this one in a in a separate short video um in a moment so we've got to look at monitoring, prediction, protection, and planning. So we're going to have to define those four words in a moment. Um, and risk from a tectonic hazard. Um, we're actually going to do a little bit of volcanoes and earthquakes here. Uh, you'll see why as we go through the video. Um, however, you don't necessarily need a case study for this. However, it will make sense to apply some of our, particularly our earthquake case study of um, New Zealand to, to parts of this. Um, Although when we uh, consider volcanoes, you won't necessarily need a case study as such. It's just the content more than um, uh, any specific example. So we're just going to focus on this second bullet point in this video. Just a little recap. I know we've done this previously uh, when we talked about responses to Typhoon Haiyan. You have to be aware that the aim of all management is to reduce damage and death, to protect the value and to reduce uh, the vulnerability of people so um if you get asked a question on the evaluation of any type of um, management if they can achieve uh, these three factors then um, the likelihood is that that management can be deemed successful so starting with monitoring um very very similar to prediction this one but the example do want them in two separate terms so monitoring is uh, the use of scientific equipment to detect warning signs it, it, in essence it is prediction in itself if you monitor something then you can predict that something's about to happen so monitoring does link with prediction but it actually is, is ever so slightly separate um, we'll start with volcanoes for this one hopefully you'll see why quite quickly as we start going through it start down here with satellites um, satellites can pick up the um, the movement of the land um, prior to a volcano erupting what i mean by that is magma will rise through the lithosphere and can actually uh cause uh the land itself to to change shape the height of the land can increase or actually decrease um or the shape of the land can actually change within the volcano us walking on it uh, on the surface probably wouldn't be able to feel those sort of changes because they're going to be very very small but a satellite could pick those changes up and then inform people that there is potential for a volcanic eruption to occur so there's satellites uh, use of remote sensing calm dioxide are probe to be relatively obvious um, before a volcanic eruption gas can escape through the vent as a result put one of these probes near it if the level of carbon dioxide increases it is your your chance to detect the warning sign that potentially this volcano could erupt um in terms of uh, the carbon dioxide probe just point out this this one actually will come up again um regarding um i guess you could say it's protecting people where um you would have studied this for new zealand where um where people were trapped by buildings sticking a co2 probe into the ground will actually pick up the breathing of people as well so a co2 probe is, is an important piece of equipment that we're going to see quite a lot of for tectonic hazards right to move across to the the last one this is a seismometer hopefully you're aware of what one of these is it, it's currently drawing a seismograph there um the pen itself here doesn't move it's it's a heavy mass it will resist motion if the earth moves um the uh, paper itself literally moves with the earth and as a result the pen will uh, draw um a line on it now in terms of an earthquake um it doesn't really monitor very well because you'll be looking at the pen as the earthquakes occurring so it, it doesn't quite work for that however for an earthquake you can get uh minor earthquakes what we call foreshocks before an earthquake and it's a case of if you get these miniature foreshocks you can send a warning out to the population the the reality is you don't always get foreshocks um so it, it's quite a tricky one to, to use for monitoring an earthquake it, it, it doesn't really always work but the idea is you can if you just see where the laser pointer is there that there is some movement prior to your larger earthquake um a number of seconds or potentially minutes later so as a result you can argue that a seismometer can give you a warning sign of potentially a larger earthquake in the future but it's it's it is kind of grasping at straws a little bit because sometimes there isn't a foreshock it's more useful uh rather confusingly for volcanoes because um 
um, as magma rises through the volcano itself, it can actually trigger very small earthquakes where the ground appears to move. Uh, and as a result, it's more useful for a volcanic eruption to say, well, actually, the magma is currently moving. The, the ground is ever so slightly shaking. And as a result, it's more useful for a volcanic eruption to evacuate people as you're going to get more of a, of a warning with that. So hopefully that makes sense. Monitoring is going to lead on to prediction, um, which we'll start with earthquakes for this, actually. It's similar to the previous where really it doesn't really work very well i'll just give you the definition quickly you use historical evidence and you monitor to make an estimation of when and where a tectonic hazard might happen so the prediction the difference here is rather than just the monitoring the prediction is literally saying when and where you believe the tectonic hazard might happen so the difference here is you're actually making a statement of saying oh, i think the earthquake or i think the volcano is going to happen here just to start with earthquakes quickly earthquakes it's um it, it's similar to the previous it's not empirically based and what that means is you, you can't really get it very accurate you, you you're kind of struggling to to give it an actual date or time um you can look for patterns uh and and therefore try and work out where an earthquake might occur um eurasian plate here in the and Tolian plate you don't really need to worry about that one too much a very 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 small tectonic plate but hopefully what you can see is these are major earthquakes through time 1939 1942 1943 1944 57 67 99 and it leads you to a prediction that at some point uh, Istanbul is going to get a very large earthquake however that's pretty much the best you can do you can say well it appears that the epicenters or focuses are moving in this direction However, you can't really say when it's going to happen. I mean, look at the gap between 1943 and 1944, for example, and then a very small gap between 1967 and 1999. So the reality is your planners in Turkey are looking at this going, well, I can predict that you're going to get an earthquake in Istanbul. However, they can't put a date on it. Um, they just can say, well, we were very likely to get one, but it could be in the year 2018 or it could be in the year 2040. It, it's it's difficult to show. And in addition, it, it could also, the earthquakes could then jump back again or could potentially jump Istanbul altogether. So it, it's a difficult one to predict earthquakes. You, you really can't predict them well at all. You can't get them to within a year or potentially even a decade. Um, so for earthquakes, very, very, very tricky. Um volcanoes however if you combine it with the previous monitoring slide uh you can actually very accurately predict the date of an eruption um i certainly remember the icelandic eruption in 2010 being predicted the year before um in november or december of um, 2009 it was said that the icelandic uh, volcano which i'm not going to try and pronounce i might try and put up on the screen in a minute um will occur around about april and uh, it did occur in april right at the end of april into the early into early may so volcanic eruptions actually you can track much better and actually give a much more accurate prediction whereas earthquakes you really are it's, it's really kind of guesswork going well look, we know it's going this way but we don't know when um volcanic eruptions you can almost give people the, the day that they think it's going to happen and that therefore allows you to put your, your plan and protection in place eg um evacuating people so just a really quick recap there in terms of monitoring and prediction volcanoes you can be relatively accurate about when uh, you believe a volcanic eruption is going to occur earthquakes however not the case y you might get zero warning whatsoever and if you're trying to guess or predict in terms of a year you can see hopefully the problem with uh, this slide below okay uh protection next uh, new zealand a fantastic example for this protection there up on the board designing buildings slash the environment to reduce damage if we just take new zealand what we already know about the buildings they have rubber foundations to absorb shock waves therefore the building is less likely to collapse you have plastic windows uh so therefore um you have less falling glass so less um cuts and grazes less spread of hepatitis if you wanted to use that as an example um furthermore uh you've got planned open spaces um we'll come on to that in the next slide as well but um christchurch central park is quite literally planned that nothing can fall on people if they can get to that point so there are some lovely examples for protecting from earthquakes um if we can use haiti as well here actually if i just think about it in haiti they did put a building code in place that said you need six steel pins in the corner of um two or three story buildings however they just couldn't enforce it 
So it, that would have potentially meant that less than 300,000 buildings would have collapsed. But it just identifies there that the classic, really, that HICs can prepare far better or protect far better than LICs. Volcanoes, uh, it's almost the other way around here for protection. Volcanoes, there's, there's little you can really do um, for a pyroclastic flow, as an example, or, or even lava flow. The speed and power of lava means it's it's very difficult to, to, to stop or to protect your buildings from it. If, you, if your building's in the way, it's, it's, it's gone. The lava will burn right through it. What you can, however, do is you can use explosives to uh, create a trench to divert the lava away. Uh, it has been used successfully in Mount Etna, however, that's really all you can do. If the lava's flowing, you, you can't ask it to stop, and you, you can't build buildings that are going to stand up to it. You can simply move the lava somewhere else. Um, other examples that have been used in the past, uh, also in Italy, uh, was to dump seawater onto the lava to try and cool it and, and harden it faster. That was far less successful, actually. But um, the idea is it kind of flips here with protection you can do quite a lot to protect from the ground shaking you can do a great deal about a lava flow coming directly for you aside from building a trench to simply take the lava somewhere else right planning uh, identifying reducing risk is a quite a generic vague definition really in terms of earthquakes i've already mentioned it on the previous slide uh, for new zealand uh, evacuation plans into open areas uh, christchurch central park is, is a really good example of that after an earthquake people are advised to go there in case there were any aftershocks there is nothing that can fall on people there they will be safe there and in addition emergency services will actually pile into that place with uh, tents food water etc Furthermore, um, planning, the classic one really is to stockpile resources. That applies to uh, both individual houses who will have a um, earthquake ready kit, generally buried um, quite close to the ground in the back garden, just in case your building collapses. You don't want to put it in the basement. You don't want to put it somewhere it can get crushed. So you put it in a back garden. Therefore, you can quickly get to it. Um, generally, you have a, a mobile phone, uh, like a Nokia brick phone in there, where it's got a very good battery life, canned food, water, uh, blankets, etc which is um, kept outside the house. So you stockpile resources is part of your plan. Um, furthermore, the city council will do the same. Christchurch has a, a huge resource ready for any potential earthquake, tents, um, blankets, etc., etc., which will mean that people can they reduce the risk of like the after effects of it, like um, being exposed to the elements or, or whatever that might be. Um, you've got an individual house plan here. My laser pointer appears to have disappeared on me. Point, apologies. This here is a individual house plan drawn up in New Zealand where actually houses are encouraged to do so by the council. And actually, school children do it in, in class to make sure they take it home to parents and go, look, this is this is how I believe we would we should escape. So whatever um, building, no, sorry, whatever building, whatever room you happen to find yourself in during an earthquake, you've got all your different routes out. So if you are, I don't know, I assume that's a dying room. Actually, we'll just do this. This is the lounge. Lounge. If you're in this half of the room, you go go out the window. If you're in that half of the room, you run out the front door. And it's just any way at all of reducing that that sort of potential risk of um, getting trapped in a building. Meeting place also outside there. Right, volcanoes, um, your plan here is to keep people safe after the initial eruptions. I I'll be really honest with you, 19 people died in the Montserrat volcano because they were here. Um, as a result, when the Sofreya Hills volcano blew up, they, they just simply they couldn't get out fast enough. 17 farmers died in that um, eruption. So the idea here is you, you stop people going anywhere near it. So this is the actual map from Montserrat where uh, the government through monitoring and predicting when this volcano is going to go off said right what we're going to do is uh, you are not allowed any resident is allowed in the orange zone and they banned people from going in they built fences and they had patrols here the problem was people ignored that and went back to tend to their crops or take photos of the volcano and that's why 19 people died um, the plan here, really, really straightforward, keep people away from the danger zones. So we've got here a daytime entry zone here, which you can only go in at, uh, during the day and under supervision. It, the reason why is you're going at night, the, the idea is it's quite a large area here. Actually, you, you might not be able to get back out. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, this is actually quite a forested area as well. So the idea is you can go in during the day because you can get out safely. 
this area up here absolutely fine you're all safe in this uh, northern about i'd say about eight kilometers of the island you're gonna be absolutely fine up there your green and black zone um is uh, slightly different but um i wouldn't worry too much about that the idea is just simply get them away from this area here we've got a map actually drawn up of where they believe the volcano would uh, potentially erupt and um with that in mind these are the reasons why you said well this area appears to be safe um in terms of uh, your monitoring prediction protection and planning you can do them for both earthquakes and volcanoes however in terms of prediction and monitoring far more effective for volcanoes protection actually you can do more to protect from an earthquake than you can from a volcano planning and stockpiling of resources obviously applies to both well, i hope that's useful come down and see us in h7 if you're not sure of any part of that